colloquium. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to present the Vice President for International Affairs, David Carrot. He and the President and others are here, also Adam, because we are planning an agreement between UNAM and Indiana University on the subtopic physics. And we had a, a long discussion this morning, which was very quite successful. So please, Dr. Carrot. very large classes, so I'm going to dispense with the uh, microphone. I, I assume you can all hear me. It seems very appropriate that if we're having a lecture by Adam, an IU faculty member. Okay, they're insisting in the back that I, that I use this. It seems appropriate uh, that we have with us uh, for today's lecture President Michael McRobbie. Uh, President McRobbie is Indiana University's 18th president, and he is now entering his 10th year uh, as president. Uh, he's been one of our most transformative uh, presidents, uh, presiding over academic reorganizations, a rebuilding of the university's uh, physical plant. Um, but among his highest priorities is deepening and broadening the range of Indiana University's international engagements. Uh, President McRobbie is a true uh, internationalist. He's Australian. Uh, you can't miss that if you talk with him. He has his uh, degree in logic. Uh, he's a computer scientist as well as uh, an administrator. Uh, his, his terminal PhD is from the Australian National University, which it and other universities have honored him with, with international awards. So, I think it's great that he's here to uh, listen to the talk. Our, our mission here is simply uh, trying to find more ways to engage with more faculty um, at this institution and in Indiana University. And so today's talk is one piece of that, of that puzzle. So without any more ado, Thank I you. turn it over to you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Well, uh, it's also a great pleasure for me to present Adam Stepaniak. He's a longtime friend of Mexico. Maybe not all of you know it. He realized his uh, PhD, uh, his licenciatura thesis, bachelor thesis, in Mexico, end of the 80s, with Marcos Moschinsky. And uh, he's a, a reg regular visitor of uh, this institute, Institute of Physics, and in a conference uh, which we have every January, the Symposium on Nuclear Physics. And he where he's also in the advisory committee, the International Advisory Committee. So you see the title of the talk. I, I, have, a, I have a microphone. Thank you, Peter. Uh, welcome, President McCarthy. Sorry. Indiana delegation. Uh, uh, I'll start with a couple of words in Spanish. Uh, uh, es un placer de estar aquí con, entre los colegas y amigos de muchos años especialmente en la sala de Marcos, eh, que, es, que fue un físico tremendo y un hombre extraordinario y también un maestro que lo quería muchísimo y quisiera dedicar este seminario en su nombre. Ok, so I'll switch to English and I'll take my jacket off because it's really hot. Um, and um, I'll what I'll try to do is to sort of give you an idea of how exciting the field of hadron physics has become in the last uh, few years and how much progress has been done and so what's the bright future is out there, uh, I believe, ahead of, still ahead of us. Now, if I have time, uh, I may get into the cloud aspect of what particle physics is, but most likely I won't get there. Uh, but nevertheless, let's see how far we can go. So, uh, the topic that I'd like to cover is uh, why hadrons? What's so special about hadrons? And of course, I'll define for you what hadrons are, but primarily is for us a tool for studying quantum, dynam quantum chromodynamics, or QCD, which is the fundamental theory of strong interactions, the force that binds us all, essentially. Then I'll come and discuss these whole series of new discoveries. 
Uh, and, and many of them, if not all, are sort of very intriguing. I mean, certainly something that we have speculated about for a long time, but nevertheless, we're still surprised when they have come along. And, and I don't think we'll still understand exactly what, what they are representing. And this sort of brings me to the challenges and opportunities that this thing uh, uh, carries. So again, we, we start with sort of the basics, the standard model that, nuclear, that particle nuclear physicists have, uh, uh, have constructed to describe the visible part of the universe. Now, as you know, the visible part of the universe is still a very small part of the entire universe, but it is the part that we can talk about. Uh, the, everything else is either dark energy or dark matter, which we have very little to say about, so let's focus on the little piece that we do have something to say about. And here it is. It's, it's in principle written by the, schematically by this very simple formula. It's called the Lagrangian of the standard model. We don't need to know the details of that, but just to again give you an impression of how s small mathematical structure there is behind the standard model. It describes how all the elementary particles what they are, what their properties are, and how they interact with each other. And we're talking about essentially everything out of the scale of the atoms, where the electromagnetism binds electrons to atomic nuclei, to the nuclei themselves, which are bound states of protons and neutrons, down to the substructure of protons and neutrons themselves, which are made of quarks and gluons, which are the things that we haven't broken into pieces yet. So those are the elementary objects that we'll be talking about. And it, indeed, it is the quarks and the gluons that I'll be concentrating about. So we're talking about structure of matter on distant scales less than something like 10 to the minus 18 meters. Now, why is so, so the standard model, we call it a model, because we try to be humble. It's not a fundamental theory. It's a standard model of interactions. And part of that standard model is the part that describes interaction between quarks and gluons and how they bind together. In principle, and why is that part so special compared to, for example, electromagnetism, which is the other aspect, or the weak theory, which is the other aspect of standard model? Well, it's because the one is the one theory that we know the least about. Uh, so interestingly, as I just said, it describes uh, the substructure of atomic nuclei, the substructure of protons and neutrons, which by themselves are objects of dimensions 10 to the minus 15 and, and smaller than that. And, but at the same time also describes, we, build, we, we, we think so, what is happening inside neutron stars, which by themselves are macroscopic objects with radius of about of kilometers. And the interior of nuclear, nu neutron stars by themselves are essentially driven by combination of nuclear physics and gravity. And inside, we, we, we think that what's happening is essentially like is a quark uh, plasma. So we're talking about macroscopic manifestations of this fundamental theory. Now, everything that is made out of quarks and gluons, protons and neutrons, and then nuclei, uh, those things which we do measure in laboratory, they are built of objects that by themselves do not exist in nature in any common sense. You cannot isolate a single quark and try to see its effect in a, in, a, in, a, in a detector. Quarks always will come together, will always bring another pairs of quarks or anti-quarks and gluons, will dress them to form more complex objects. Those more complex objects are the things that we call hadrons. And they, by themselves, do not, cannot exist in isolation. This is a phenomenon which we refer to as confinement. And we still don't understand exactly why that happens. And I'll try to illustrate some of the issues uh, that is related to that question, or, the, or lack of the answer to that question. But it's one of these questions which is sort of being posed as the key fundamental question or issue in physics for the next millennium. And hopefully in this millennium it's going to get resolved. Uh, now, gluons, I'm talking about quarks and gluons. We usually refer to quarks as the matter particles and gluons as the mediators of the force. In a similar sense as electrons, for example, are the object, the matter, components, and photons are the mediators of electromagnetic force. Now, gluons are different than photons because gluons also carry the same charge that is responsible for interactions. The charge, as you know, we refer to as color. So gluons by themselves interact with, the, with each other. They don't need, they are not just the mediators of the force. They at the same time behave as matter fields because they carry the charge that they can interact with. 
And it turns out that if you sort of try to weight things, if you weight a proton, naively speaking, the proton will be made of matter components, the quarks. So the mass of the proton will be roughly speaking, we would expect to be roughly speaking the same as the mass of the quarks that made the proton. That's not the case. The quarks that made out the proton contribute only a tiny fraction, just a few percent of the mass of the proton. Everything that is there essentially comes from E equals mc squared. The energy of fast-moving gluons is equivalent to the mass of the proton. So it's the, it's, the, it's the dynamics of the gluons that generates mass of the proton. So the, essentially the entire visible mass that we see in the universe is, is, is associated with gluons, which are particles that do not exist in the common sense. Furthermore, these are particles that do not have any charge that we can poke. They don't have electric charge. We cannot not knock them out. We cannot measure their individual properties. So we have this conundrum that every, we are made out of stuff that is essentially impossible to measure. And one part of this talk is to try to argue that we now may be seeing hints or have an idea of how to maybe poke these objects out of the, out of the interior of things like protons. So again, because of these of this aspect that gluons themselves can interact with themselves, they by themselves, we expect, can form novel forms of matter. You could imagine gluons binding with each other and forming particles which have no matter fields, who have no quarks. They are objects that are made, in a sense, purely from radiation. These are referred to as globals. It's like you could imagine two photons coming together and orbiting around each other and forming a bound state. With photons, that doesn't happen because of the form of interactions that they have, but with gluons it can happen. And again, one of the, one of the, one of the goals of certain many experiments is to see if they can produce these particles in, 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 in experiment. Uh, I'll, again, I'll, I'll come in a moment to why, why, this ha why this happens with strong interaction and it does not happen with electromagnetism, but the, the key aspect of the difference is that this is indeed a, something which is called a strong force, strong interactions. And it's the only such a fundamental theory that we have in nature. So maybe if the world beyond the standard model is also of some nature, because is, is, is built on some other type of, of strong interacting forces, this could be a template for the physics beyond the standard model. And there's, of course, a lot of research going in this direction. And again, for somebody like a young graduate student who wants to do theory, this is a perfect, uh, perfect place to to try on because it's impossible to solve. There's the, basically, there is no mathematics. I mean, mathematicians have been sort of lagging behind us. They haven't given us the tools yet. So they gave us this, like, this simple equation that I had in the other slide for the Lagrangian, but they haven't given us the tools of what to do with it. So, so we essentially have no tools of how to deal with something which is called strongly coupled relativistic field theory. Uh, and that's the reason why we're still struggling with getting, with getting the, 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 key, the, 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 the precise answers, but I'll show you we're doing all we can to get an idea of what's going on. Okay, so hadrons again, it, uh, everything which is basically beta of quarks and gluons, in most part, we don't have precise knowledge of how that happens. I'll show you some examples, and we do think we do have a, a, a good knowledge of how things happen. Now, this, this essentially started from the discovery of the first hadrons, which is the existence of atomic nuclei in the first place. So this is uh, Rutherford uh, and his group's experiment uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, then later, th this, this experiment, by the way, was done using alpha particles uh, uh, that were shot on, 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 on tin metal, metal foils, and, and that's how it was discovered that the matter uh, in atoms is concentrated in small volumes rather than uh, in large volumes that occupy the, the entire atom. Then was discovered what this matter is made of. That's made of protons and neutrons. And, and after, so the first um, modern accelerators have been uh, put in, uh, in, in, in operation, so sometime in the, in the middle of, of last century. Now we've discovered something like had hundreds of these different types of particles that are made of quarks and gluons. Most of them are very unstable, so create them in the laboratory can identify some of their properties by measuring their decay pattern, and then, as I said, they disappear on the time scales of the order of 10 to the minus 24 seconds. And here we see some examples of why that happens, how that happens with all those peaks. Again, I'm not going into details, but all those peaks correspond like in peaks in the spectrum, and they correspond to, this, to individual of these particles. 
individual uh, uh, signatures for these particles. Now, in, in motor days, uh, essentially two types of experiments that are used to uh, study hadrons. These are either collider experiments or what are called fixed target experiments. Collider experiments, for example, is E plus E minus machines. There is a machine like that in Beijing. There's also a machine uh, like that in, uh, in Japan. Uh, this, is, this is schematics of, of, of how the machine like this works. You shoot electron and positron. They come together. They annihilate. We know exactly how that happens. This is an electromagnetic process as I've depicted here. When they annihilate, they produce a, a photon. That photon then, typically what we'll do is we'll, we'll again convert into very various types of particles. We are interested in, in isolating events in which this photon converts into particles made out of quarks. So for example, photon can convert into quark and an anti-quark, which eventually will create more quarks along the way. And eventually what you see in the detector is a bunch of clusters that, of showers of particles, which are called jets, that came out of production of these pairs of quarks. And this is what you see here referred to as the continuum. Essentially, they can produce uh, showers of various types of energy. So you see uh, production ranging for, uh, over a wide range of masses. Now, on occasion, what will happen is that these quarks and antiquarks that, that came out of the photon, they will stick together for a while. And maybe they will create more quarks that stick together for a while. And that's how a resonance is formed. And this is depicted here by this blob, which is called, in this particular case, a raw meson, a raw resonance. And the name, there's a nomenclature that has been designed, adopted by particle physicists, of how we select the names for these different types of resonances, which is based on their spins, their parities, uh, their charges, and so on and so forth. So raw is, again, something which essentially has spin one, just like the photon itself. So again, when these quarks and gluons come together, they live for a while. And eventually, they decay into other types of hadrons that contain quark and antiquarks that are more stable or completely stable under strong interactions and therefore can be detector, detected in the detectors. In this case, there are two pions. So this is known. This is known. And every time you see a blob, that means that, well, we have no idea what happens. So pretty much, we don't know what happens inside. Here is an idea of what might be happening, but we're not sure. I'll show you in a moment why. Uh, in a fixed target experiment, as the name suggests, there's a target. For example, hydrogen, and there is an electron beam, for example. This is, a, this is the typical setup at the Jefferson lab, and there's a pion beam, which is at the compass experiment at LHC. And then the, this beam is scattering of everything that is around your target, which contains a bunch of quarks and gluons, and they come together again. They can stick uh, together for a while and produce a blob, which contains resonances, and then you'll see, you want to see them out of measuring the decay pattern of, of the particles that they uh, disappear into. So the world that we're trying to describe is very small. Ideally, what we'd like to do is we would like to answer the following question. Given this large number of hadrons that we have observed, given that we know in principle theory that tells us how quarks and gluons come together to build these hadrons, well, how do we put these two things together? I mean, how do we can, can we make predictions of exactly how this theory works, what type of matter we should be able to see, what type of particles we should be able to detect, can we do some kind of a tomography? Can we take some kind of pictures or snapshots of what's inside proton, what's inside neutron, how the quarks and gluons behave, how they arrange themselves? So the world we're talking about is very small. The particles inside move very fast, essentially move with speed of light, so relativity is key. And they are exerting forces of the order of a ton. So that's why when a nuclear bomb goes out, there's such a big effect. Now, a nuclear bomb is actually a it's, 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 it's an electromagnetic effect is, is when, when there is an imbalance between, between electromagnetism and nuclear forces. But the reason is because the, the, the underlying forces are very strong. And, as, and literally, the, the quarks that are the forces that bind quarks together inside, the, inside protons and neutrons of the order of a ton. So how do we think about a world like that? And as I said, we don't have the tools. We don't have an imagination, basically, that, all can, that can operate in a world like this, because we are, of course, big. And our intuition has not evolved to tell us exactly what happens in this type of a universe. Now, and, and a simplifying picture uh, was that, that, that things which are, the, the class of hadrons which are referred to as baryons, which are basically hadrons which have spin one half or, or, or three halves and, and half integer spin, essentially are made of three quarks, and mesons are made of two quarks, a quark and an antiquark. And the gluons are basically not very much, not, not of much importance. They're only there to keep the quarks together. 
you can think of this as sort of some uh, generalizations of, 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 of atoms, uh, where you have shells or, 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 or nuclei, uh, simple uh, shell, uh, shell, shell model description of nuclei. We have individual objects orbiting in some uh, sort of individual orbitals, and, and that's how you build the bound states. Now, to illustrate that this is very naive, uh, I'll give you a, a, a one-minute crash course in field theory. Uh, so what are the particles in the first place? So we're talking about particles, quarks, and gluons. These are fundamental particles. How do we describe them? Uh, we don't describe them uh, in terms of putting them as such, as objects, and somehow describing their interactions based on what we have put in. Particles by themselves are emergent phenomena. So we introduce some which are called fields, which I think if we were to talk to Maxwell, he will say, oh, this is, an this is an excitation of an ether. Well, OK, let's call it ether, except that we don't associate any material properties to that thing. It's a purely mathematical object. So I have an ether that doesn't really exist. This ether can have excitations. And if these excitations are simple, like excitations of a string, then essentially how fast those excitations propagate in the, in the spatial direction, that they will carry now energy and momentum. And if something looks like a duck and it walks like a duck, it must be a duck. So something that carries energy and momentum is an object, it's a particle. So that's how particles emerge in nature. So essentially, particles themselves are basically solutions of harmonic oscillator. And this is the most appropriate place to talk about harmonic oscillator, because we are in Mark Mashinsky's auditorium, who, as you of course know, is the inventor of everything there is to know about harmonic oscillator. So we're talking about so, so the interaction, basically, particles are just eigenstates of harmonic oscillator. And the reason why they are not just flying free is because they are unharmonic terms. There's something beyond that breaks, essentially, the p squared plus x squared. Uh, in uh, harmonic oscillator uh, Hamiltonian. So what breaks this? Well, any unharmonic term will introduce interaction between this emergent phenomenon and the particles. And if you look at quantum electrodynamics, uh, uh, just the normal light, what we find is that the bare electron, the electron which is just this plane wave flowing through the ether, is not very different from the physical electron because these unharmonic interactions are very weak. So in nature, they represent, for example, interactions of electrons and the photons, but the strength of the interaction is very small, so the bare electron and the physical electron are much different. And that's why we can measure free electrons uh, flying uh, through space. Now, in quantum chromodynamics, this interaction is very strong, so we cannot simply say that the, that the quark is just a quark plus a little bit of something else, for example, a quark and a gluon. A quark may be in two gluons. Because the interactions of the order of one, the there is an equal probability for there to be one, two, three, four million gluons together. So we don't know what the quark is. Because it, it's quark plus everything else that could be around the quark. So this is the problem. We don't have the mathematical tools for describing this type of uh, phenomenon. Now, well, of course, there are, there are more technical issues with the fact that this is indeed uh, a field theory that the, that the strength of interactions is not sort of set in stone, that how these particles interact with each other actually depends on how close together they are, for example. So when quarks and gluons interact with very high energies and they happen to come very close to each other, interaction becomes weak. And that's why it's easier to study, in a sense, quarks in high energy experiments. But that when, when they are far away from each other, and far away, that means of the order of a nuclear scale, 10 to the minus 15 meters, that's where this interaction is strong. And it's very difficult to indeed, uh, uh, from first principle, calculate how many quarks and gluons are there inside a proton, any number in principle. So now I've already mentioned there was this very naive picture of what happens inside protons and neutrons that was due to Gelman and Spike. It's 50 years old, almost exactly 50 years old. And essentially, the idea was that, well, it's simple. It's just three, three, either three, or, or three quarks per hadron, or two quarks, or, or better, quark and an antiquark per hadron. Now, the reason why they have come up with this idea is that, fortunately, they didn't know what the theory was. So QCD was invented later. So all that they had in their disposal is this vast number of observations of hadrons. They look at the patterns, they look at the symmetries, and they simply say, OK, what kind of simpler objects I have to put in with simple pro simpler properties that I can put together to reproduce this entire zoo of particles? 
And they have come up with this classification scheme that you need either three or two, and that's it. And that covers essentially everything that is being seen. Now, if they knew the underlying QCD, I bet they would never come up with this. Because there's absolutely no reason why it should be so simple, because I just said, I mean, quarks are complicated beasts and gluons. They all dress up together. Now, what's amazing is that this thing works. There's absolutely no reason why it should work, but it works. And here is sort of an illustration. So basically, basically as, as I said, there's a class of hadrons which we believe are such a made of quark and an antiquark. We refer to them as mesons. Class of hadrons which are made of three quarks, we refer to them as baryons. So let's look, at, let's look at the meson because it's simple, it's just two. So it's like a positronium in a sense, two electron and positron orbiting each other. You just replace electron and positron by quark and an antiquark. You put them in some orbital angle momentum state. You add their, up their individual spins. Maybe you do some radial excitations. And you have a prediction of a whole set of energy levels that you'd expect that are classified by, again, by spins, properties, uh, uh, spins, parity, charge conjugation, etc., etc. Now, so this is sort of a theoretical prediction. Now, of course, you have to have an idea of how, what is the force between them that bind them. If this was positronium, this would be just a Coulomb potential, just like electromagnetism. A Coulomb potential is basically something like this. So this is a potential as a function of the distance. Coulomb potential will be something which is divergent, 1 over r, and then essentially flattens out at large distances. What happens here, for some reason, which we'll come to in a moment, what you need is a potential which grows as the separation between these objects grows. So you see a potential which is essentially a linear function of the separation between them. That's often referred to as a Cornell potential because the group in Cornell was essentially the first in, in early 80s to do systematic studies of bound states of quarks and gluons based on such a potential and essentially come up with something like this that what you see perfectly matches this very naive picture. So they are very, the names here are the names that people have given to these various combinations of quark and antiquarks, JSI, ADA, KC, and so on and so forth. But the point here is they essentially all lie down on the predicted energy levels. And so there's absolutely no reason why they should. And there's no reason why, why this thing should be, uh, at least according to what I just told you about QCD, why, why the picture should be so simple. OK, so we don't know why it is. But it, it does seem to work. OK, so what, what may be happening? Why maybe things like that do work? So let's, let's say a few words about that. So for example, the question, why the potential between quark and an quark is there in the first place, and why it is sort of a this linear form that it rises as the separation between quark and an quark rises? Well, first of all, if I have very heavy quarks, then it's then are essentially non-relativistic. They are heavy. So any type of radiation effects that they would produce to is small, smaller compared to light objects. That's normal sort of relativistic effects. So yes, maybe having just pair of quark and an antiquark and not producing more quark antiquark pairs of that mass is a reasonable approximation that we just have two. So now why why all the gluons, which can which can be many, any number of them floating around, what do we think now, what needs to happen, they have to rearrange themselves in such a way that effectively they, to, they produce an effective force between quark and an antiquark, which has this linear aspect. Now, what has a linear aspect? Well, then again, that goes back to many, many years when this theory was first looked at seriously uh, to people like uh, Mandelstam and Nam Nambu. They realized, OK, what, what, what makes a linear potential is a string. Okay? So if the gluons essentially rearrange themselves in such a way that in electromagnetism, photons will form a dipole here. But, but in, in, in QCD, we, are, we believe they don't form a dipole. They form sort of this collimated flux, electric flux, or chromoelectric flux. Now, how do you get such a flux? Well, you get such a flux if you think, how could such a flux happen? Such a flux could happen if you think about uh, superconductors. Uh, in superconductors, if you, if you put a superconductor in an external magnetic field, and if you want to remove the magnetic field, then, of course, Faraday law would say, well, you generate ED currents floating around from, from all the elect essentially free electrons. And those ED currents will prevent the magnetic field from getting out. So the magnetic field is trapped in a superconductor in forms of very thin fluxes. So now convert a normal superconductor into an uh, electric superconductor into a magnetic superconductor. And you say, in a magnetic superconductor, you have some sort of a magnetic charge, which is free to move. And then if you have electric charge and you want to remove that, and by the same token, magnetic 
magnetic current is going to form that prevents the electric flux from disappearing, and you have trapped electric field. So this is a trapped electric field, or chrome electric field in this case, which is trapped by free flow of magnetic charges. Now, how do I get magnetic charges from? We know that magnetic monopoles do not exist in electromagnetism, but ma magnetic monopoles in quantum, quantum chromodynamics can exist, and most likely they do exist. So all these nonlinear terms can indeed pro provide a source of magnetic monopoles. And this is, this is an area which is uh, 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 very extensively being investigated in numerical simulations of this theory, is whether indeed this sort of magnetic confinement scenario is there, uh, and this is indeed the mechanism that with the traps, quarks, and gluons uh, on provides confinement. Okay, so how, how studying hadrons can help us address this question of how quarks and gluons bind together and, and what do they do around us? How do we poke gluons? So I told you, gluons, they're essentially the only thing that they know is that they have this strong charge. They don't have anything else that we have built detectors for. It's essentially based on electromagnetism. They don't have electromagnetic charge that, don't, that we can shine light off and see them. So how do we poke them? How do we take pictures of what's happening inside protons? And can we effectively calculate and make predictions of what, uh, what these particles do when they, when they come together and build hadrons? Now, there's been a tremendous progress on experimental front in the last few years, and this is because of developments in both accelerator techniques and, and detection techniques. So there is a number of experiments that are either running right now or are being proposed. Uh, the, the experiments that I'll be talking about, or results, some of the results that I'll be talking about come essentially from a selected group of these experiments, from the LHCB experiment, which is one of the experiments at, at CERN, that I'm sure you've all heard about, uh, the, um, uh, the BESS experiment and the, and the Bell experiments, which are the electron-positron colliding machines in, 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 in China, in Beijing, and in Japan. Uh, and then also make some, uh, and also the, the COMPASS experiment uh, uh, also from, from CERN. So one question that I would like to focus in the rest of this talk is, for example, okay, so we know Gelman and Zweig told us for no reason that the simple picture of, of hadrons works, that it's only three quarks or quark antiquarks. And indeed, almost everything that we've seen so far can to a good approximation be associated with such a pattern. So one way to investigate wh whether, whether there is a world out there that can tell us more about the inner workings of QCD is to see if we can experimentally identify something which cannot explicitly be associated with the simple picture. So for example, we could, we could think about glue balls. I mentioned those. These are objects made from pure, pure radiation of, 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 of gluons coming together. Things which are referred to as pentaquarks, which have to, ha have, to have five quarks at least. Uh, things which are called diberions, which are six and three and three coming together, but close packed, and so on and so forth. Now, I'll, I'll focus about, uh, I'll talk about uh, essentially three of those, so let me start with something which is called hybrid, which is a very hot topic these days, because hybrids, they are supposedly to have unique signatures of gluons. So I told you, we don't know how to poke gluons. But if we establish existence of hybrids, those would have to be there only because the gluons do something unusual would you expect them to do in the normal three, three quark variants or two quark mesons. So let's talk about hybrids first. Now, the, I told you there is no analytical methods. Mathematicians have not given us analytical methods to study quantum chromodynamics. But we can study quantum dynamics numerically through what are called lattice simulations. And there's a, there's a whole industry around the world of doing, of doing lattice simulations. And essentially, the idea is basically, I told you, these, the, the system is described as fields in the ether. None of these make any sense because ether doesn't exist and fields do not exist. But hey, when they carry energy, energy exists. So what you do is you take the space-time, you discretize, you put the space-time in, in a box. Box has to be at least 10 to the minus 15 big because it has to hold in a couple of these hadrons. And then you discretize the box into individual cells. And then instead of having continuum variables like the fields, you have this thick, the strict number of variables that oscillate in every side of this box. So, you have a set, so now harmonic oscillator really becomes a set of couple harmonic oscillators that every student in quantum mechanics can solve. And then there are harmonic terms. 
And you just want, and now you have a system with finite number of variables, and of course there are many techniques of diagonalizing the system, and the best technique to do that turns out to be Monte Carlo simulations in Euclidean space, and that's what Lattice QCD is all about. So one particular thing that one can ask the following question is, what is the energy of a single quark? So one can, the way that this thing is done is one in, in takes, puts something that will correspond to a single quark on one lattice side, and then this is not an eigenstate of this Hamiltonian, so you apply the operator e to the minus h beta to thermalize the system, and you ask the question, what is the energy of the system after it thermalized? And what you find is that it's infinite. Which makes sense because quarks are not supposed to exist. So maybe in the world that you have infinite energy of disposal, you can create a quark, but not in our world. Good. So far, so good. Now you put two quarks at a given separation, now you measure energy of that system, and that's something that we, if they are very heavy, then that energy will be just separate, be a function of separation of the quarks. We essentially measure the potential energy of two infinite static charges. And this is sort of the, what I was showing you before, these little points on a straight light rising. These are the results of lattice simulation of that quantity. What is the energy of a system of quark and anti-quark? What you can do is you can also prepare the system. Now, there's a lot of nice algorithms of how to do that, that you force the gluons, which are out there, to be in some spatially non-trivial state. So that the whole system, which is quark, anti-quark, and the gluons, have angular momentum, for example, coming from the gluons orbiting the quark and the anti-quark. So you're making like diatomic molecules in which the role of the gluons is equivalent to the role of the electrons. And the electrons in the, in the orbitals of the, two, uh, of the two atoms in the molecule can be in different orbitals and have different, different symmetries, different parities, different spins. So on the left-hand side, you have a typical spectrum of energies of the atomic molecules. And you see here is a binding here. So again, if the, if the separation of atoms grows, then of course they don't interact. If they come too close, then the electronic clouds repel each other. And then you have a minimum. And this is the equivalent sort of spectrum for quark and an anti-quark. And you see they always rise. They're always attractive. So it takes an infinite energy to pull them apart. As, as the distance grows, the energy grows. And that's why you cannot pull them apart. This is confined. But not only, because we not only have this ground state energy, but we also have these energies of excited gluons, we can maybe do something like what we would do with this. We could use this potential, essentially, in the Schrodinger equation and solve for the spectrum of state made out of quark and an antiquark and gluons doing basically as little as they can versus calculate a spectrum of a system which we have quark and antiquark and gluons being explicitly in an excited state. And this would be these hybrids and make predictions of whether such particles exist. So here's sort of an illustration. Uh, again, this is the ground state quark antiquark energy. This is the energy when the gluons are explicitly orbiting in some non-trivial state. And it turns out that, again, if one looks closely at the properties of these orbitals, it looks like that effectively, again, we don't understand why. We basically try, just try to describe the system. These extra gluons behave as particles with spin one, positive parity, and negative charge conjugation. Again, I'm not going to go into details what it means, but it, this gives us some clue of how to describe these objects. So now we say, OK, effectively, what, what these lattice simulations are telling us that maybe there should exist particles which have quark anti quark and this extra vector like particle zooming around with well defined interactions as determined, for example, by these orbitals. And we make and make prediction, uh, adding just very naive, adding quantum numbers, we're predicting such existence of four, four states of particles with this particular set of quantum numbers. And here is then full blown lattice gauge simulation that predicts existence of exactly this type of particles. Again, I'm not going to go into details, but this is our first. I would say rigorous as we define rigorous right now by numerical lattice simulations, QCD prediction that such particle multiplet of hadrons with explicit warning degrees of freedom should exist. Now, one of these four is highlighted here in red because it turns out that it's impossible to obtain this set of quantum numbers from just quark and an anti-quark alone. It is possible to take quark and an anti-quark alone, combine their spins and orbital angular momentum, and create particles with this 1 minus minus quantum numbers. But you cannot do that and create 1 minus plus quantum numbers. Now, even though all of them have explicit gluons in them, we know that from the lattice simulation, only this one cannot possibly mix with quarks, anti-quarks, and no gluons. 
So this is the one that all experiments are now focusing on. This is called an, an, an exotic hybrid. Exotic because of exotic quantum numbers. Can we, can we really see this in an experiment? And there's a number of experiments that have indicated possible existence of such a such an object. Most recent one is from a compass experiment. As you can see here, statistics is not very high uh, because it's a, these are sort of very, very specific channels that you have to look at, how to produce, how they decay. So more statistics is clearly needed to confirm existence of these objects. Now, let me now say a few words about the dimeson molecules again. So this is, well, this is not sort of as exotic as gluons themselves. But nevertheless, we've never seen explicitly objects which we know, for example, would, cannot again be described in terms of quark and antiquark. They have to have, for example, four quark components to them. So I already show you that the, there's a lot of mesons uh, that fit in uh, the, the, the template expected for quarks and antiquarks. But also, there's been a lot of states in the last 10 or so years uh, seen that do not feel that pattern. The first one that started this new revolution, and it's really referred to as the revolution, the, it's also referred to as the XYZ revolution. We give the particles names like X, Y, and Z, precisely because we don't yet understand exactly what they are. There's this thing called the X3872. It's being discovered, observed in many experiments now. This is sort of the quality of the signal that is typically associated with this object. And its light, its mass is over here. This, its quantum numbers are, are over there. And basically, it's, it's far away from where you expect a state like this to be if it was just quark and an anti-quark. Now, it is very intriguing that it exists very close to where the mass of two individual mesons, the mesons which are called D and D star could be, it indeed hinting that maybe this object is somehow a bound state or a molecule made out of these two other mesons called D and D star. Now, there is, a, there is something which is even more exciting than this, which is being first observed in uh, the, uh, the BESS experiment and very uh, soon confirmed in the Bell experiment, which is called Z sub C, 1300. It's very, again, it's observed in this E plus E minus colliding experiment. It's very intriguing because we know if this, if this thing is really confirmed and its structure is determined, it has to be made out of four quarks at least because we know that it definitely has to confirm, contain charm quarks, a pair of charm and an anti-charm. That's because it decays to this particle called J sub C. But it also has positive charge, so it must have additional light quarks to give it a unit electric charge. So for this reason, it definitely has to have two uh, four quarks. And there is a whole set of states that have been observed in these collider experiments in the last 10 years that still require better understanding. So what are they made of? Uh, let me just say a few words about the pentaquark. So, so some of you may have heard there was a lot of excitement about 10 or so years. Uh, something like um, 10 or 15 experiments around the world have essentially within a period of one year claimed existence of a pentaquark. Um, I'll tell you a, a little story. I was giving a talk in the conference in, 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 in Sardinia uh, in, the, in the sort of height of the pentaquark interest, and I was so skeptical about the sightings. Uh, I come back to the US, I go through customs in Philadelphia, and the police officer, I, I sort of get ahead of the line, the police officer looks at my passport, and I say, okay, so what do you do? I'm a physicist. What can you tell me about a pentaquark? <laughs> so it was popular. I mean, many people knew about it. Now, indeed, that pentaquark went away. I mean, it was, it was a sad story. You had 10 or so experiments all seeing a pentaquark, and it turns out that each one of them, there was something wrong with each one of, of these experiments. They all, at the end of the day, were sort of zooming in their interest into this one particular effect, and it went away. Now, also theorists were predicting that it should happen. So everybody, you know, was this collective uh, wave that wanted this pentaquark to exist. But science works this way, and if it's not there, it, didn't, it, it disappeared. Now, it reappeared. It reappeared uh, last year in summer. Now, a completely different pentaquark. Now, uh, it's different because it's made of different quarks. Again, we don't know if this is real, but it has different characteristics, and that makes it m different from, from the ones that we've seen, or have not seen before. So this pentaquark was, was observed in the LHCb experiment. 
Again, it's a colliding experiment. Many particles are produced. Among them, there's this particle which is called lambda b, uh, which is a sort of a normal but very heavy baryon that contains a big quark that we lives for a f long time uh, on the scale of strong interaction because it doesn't decay strongly, it decays weakly. And in particular, when it decays in this, in this particular channel, it decays into a J psi particle, which contains charm and anti-charm, a proton, and another meson, which is called K. And then if you look at the spectrum of the J psi and the proton, you see this huge peak here. Again, so just like you look at the spectrum, you see a peak, okay, this is a particle, this is a resonance, or this is this resonance. So this resonance is made out of a, or contains a proton, or it decays into a proton, which has, naively speaking, three quarks, and a J-psi, which naively speaking has quark and an anti-quark, so the whole thing has five quarks. There's no other way. It has to have these five quarks. And as you can see, it's being very popular. It's being um, all, over the, all over the press. Now, I'm zooming in here. Now, this is, this is a very sophisticated analysis. Um, and, and, and this peak here illustrates essentially what you need to put in on top of things that you do think you know in order to describe this measured spectrum. And the things that you do think you know are described by these continuous lines. And the point is that these continuous lines themselves, they do add up essentially to everything here except the peak. So you need to add this peak on, and that's the evidence of the pentachord. The question, for example, is do the things that we do, we do think we know, do we really know them that well? And this is, for example, where Cesar uh, Fernandez Ramirez here uh, has done a lot of work on, on precisely understanding these things which are called backgrounds in this particular case, and he will be uh, following up with his analysis uh, to, uh, to, to, and working with the LHC collaborators here to really see if we do know that background that well so that we can clearly say that something is missing and, 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 and it's an indication of the pentacle. So we see these, these, ev these evidence that these various peaks, certainly they are there for many of these states, um, and, and, and the question is, okay, if they are real, indeed, how do we determine that they are made of two quarks, sorry, quarks, two quarks and a gluon, five quarks, uh, meson uh, molecules, etc. Et so how do I define what's going on inside? Now, so this is the ideal world. Uh, we do an experiment, we look at the decay products, and we see these sharp peaks. This is of the spectrum of the hydrogen. That's how we identify the excited levels of the hydrogen. More or less what, closer to what we see in strong interactions is the spectrum of the violin, where you see peaks, which are a combination of vibrations of the box and vibration of the string. And you want to know the spectrum of the string, well, you have to deconvolute from the measured spectrum the vibrations of the background, the box here. And we feel facing sort of a similar situation here, so we need to understand what the backgrounds are, what is the, all the hadronic processes that go on, uh, that we have to take into account before we isolate individual signals. And, uh, well, just like we cannot solve QCD, if we could solve QCD, we could calculate these background processes. We cannot solve it, so we have to do, we can use all the things that we know are there to build the reaction amplitudes, and this goes by sort of principles of relativistic asymmetric theory, which are fairly straightforward, but they are very difficult to implement with, and this is uh, where a lot of effort is going on these days on the theoretical side to understand how to construct this sample. Just to give you an illustration of how this works, a deuteron, as most of you know, is the bound state of a proton and neutron in a particular spin configuration. And that interaction is very weak, so the deuteron is very weakly bound system of proton and neutron. For example, if you change the spins, then the interaction becomes slightly weaker, and it's all and it's an un un unbound system. Now, if you were to do proton-neutron scattering in the spin configuration, which corresponds to the deuteron, you'll see, so this is, this is of the real axis, this is the energy, you'll see the amplitude essentially following this line, and if you were to continue it to the unphysical region where the deuteron mass is, is a bound state, so it doesn't appear in the scattering experiment, you will see it appear as a huge jump in the amplitude, essentially an infinity. But again, it's good, you don't measure there, so infinities are allowed. In terms of mathematics, it, 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 it corresponds to something which, which is called a simple pole in the scattering amplitudes. Because scattering amplitude has a simple pole associated with the existence of a bound state. Now, if you change the spins, mathematically, the nice thing about complex analysis, 
this is what I tell my students, go back and, and study complex analysis, is that it's very complex, analysis, complex functions are very restrictive. Things do not appear or disappear simply. So poles cannot appear or disappear. They can move. So I change the interaction slightly. A pole cannot disappear. It can only move around and show up as a different object in the physical measurement. So for example, a bound state turns into something which is called a virtual state. And that corresponds to a pole moving around uh, in the complex plane. So this is what we do. Essentially, we try to identify, we try to construct amplitudes in various locations of poles and other singularities and see what, what kind of measurement fact uh, they correspond to. And for example, if you collect the data on this Z sub C particle, which I said could be a, f a, f a, a, a state that contains four quarks, the data is not good enough yet to tell us. I mean, I can assume that it's a bound state. I assume it's a virtual state and do the analysis of experimental data, and I cannot discriminate. The quality of description is similar in both cases. So we need a better data to be able to discriminate what type of uh, particle this may be corresponding to. Now, so this is, th that was an example of data not yet being good enough, but we have other data, we have other channels, which are just unbelievably good. Okay? So this is a particular reaction which is very uh, rich in, 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 in possible, ex possible uh, uh, resonance uh, features there, uh, which is a, a diffractive production of free ions. And, and here we see sort of the evolution of this data along the years from various experiments. So we're talking about 90s, 70s, uh, then moving on to where I moved to Indiana and we started to analyzing data from this uh, experiment at Brookhaven, EA52 experiment. And this is now a, a sample from an experiment at, at, uh, at, um, at CERN, uh, the COMPASS experiment which essentially is so much data that if you use any of your plotting, uh, 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 plotting tools that you calculate a, a function, I know I use GNU plot uh, to do plots on, on my Mac, essentially the, the, the curve is as smooth as you would get, the curve from the data is as smooth as the curve that you would get from all these analytical plotting devices. So there are these huge data samples that require now analysis that goes beyond just one laptop one computer. So for this reason, what we're doing is we're building tools that enable us to do analysis with complicated, uh, uh, complicated or, or as sophisticated reaction amplitudes that we can come up with that combines data sets from various experiments that uh, have all the theory built in, that can do simulations, that can uh, plot results and, and eventually and are accessible to both theorists and experimentalists. Um, uh, uh, for, for an analysis interpretation. And we do this as part of uh, Joint Physics Analysis Center. This is a center uh, that's being established uh, between Indiana University and Jefferson Lab and has a worldwide reach uh, where essentially the center is being dedicated to performing this type of analysis for various data sets. Primarily we focus on the forthcoming experiments at Jefferson Lab but also to uh, supply uh, a theoretical description of uh, other experiments that, I, that I've mentioned. Uh, we started this center about three years ago. We just went through our first very successful three years uh, for your review. Uh, uh, as I said, it's, it's essentially centered uh, between uh, two institutions, but we have of the of about 20 members wall, located worldwide that participate in this analysis. Uh, we average about one paper a month. Uh, there's a number of activities that we have been involved with, and as I said, this couldn't be made possible uh, without a group of very young, enthusiastic students and postdocs. Some of them you may recognize here. Um, Vincent, he was visiting here a few months ago. I think Cesar may be joining here uh, remotely, um, and as I said, uh, it's uh, many people uh, working on together from many parts of the world, and I'm hoping that we're going to part of this uh, program that we did, that we, the agreement that we are working on between Indiana University and UNAM uh, will help us building on these efforts and grow this effort. So let me summarize. Uh, there is a, the, there's a number of very tantalizing uh, this possible discoveries, signatures of new hadrons. The new hadrons definitely will be telling us something that we have not yet appreciated about QCD, uh, but in order to do that, we need to work together and hopefully soon we'll address the fundamental questions, what does the glue that binds us all look like? Thank you.
Other questions? Actually, I think lattice QCD operates in the Lagrangian formulation, and it, uh, it, what, what it is about is performing a functional integral numerical approximation, so one takes the Euclidean action as a probability uh, measure, a Boltzmann factor, and then uh, generates configuration with this probability, Thank you so much. and so we then we can measure an endpoint function, and its decay uh, gives us the masses. Uh, the method that you describe works very well in quantum mechanics, and Peter, I think, tries to apply it also in, in field theory and QCD, but it is not actually what lattice QCD is doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I, I, yeah. okay. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you're absolutely right. Lattice, of course, is not Hamiltonian lattice. And then also your remark about dual superconductors scenario. Uh, this was done, in fact, with, with, by several groups until the 90s, but I think is a common agreement that it has failed to produce a convincing confinement scenario equally to uh, instant on and central vortices uh, scenarios and so on. As far as I know, it is, quite, it is actually a bit out of fashion. I think no, no lattice group is really doing that anymore. Okay. okay. And uh, a few more comments. Okay. okay. So, 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 yes, yeah, so I, I, of course, I d this was not a lattice stock. So I could not really talk about how lattice works. So you're absolutely right, of course, lattice is, is a Euclidean formulation with Monte Carlo simulation of, of the field configurations. And, and it's certainly not a Hamiltonian lattice. Of course, people long time ago tried to do Hamiltonian lattice calculations, but that basically didn't work. I mean, the numerical methods are, uh, are far superior if you do it the modern way with, with Monte Carlo and, and, and Euclidean four space, four dimensional space. Now, in terms of magnetic scenario, I think the jury is still out. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, this is, I mean, I mentioned, I mean, the, the original idea goes back to the 70s, um, where lattice essentially did not exist. Uh, then many, many groups have worked on establishing the magnetic confinement scenario uh, in many different ways. Uh, and, and it is probably true that the simplest magnetic confinement driven by essentially equivalent to magnetic monopoles it's not enough. But, it doesn't, but, but existence of field configurations, gluonic field configurations with magnetic charges is, is probably is undisputed. I mean, it's there. Now, exactly which part of this, and there are many of them. There are magnetic monopoles, there are center vortices that you've mentioned, there are dions. Uh, there's all sort of, of various configurations which are typically first uh, looked for or identified uh, using semi-classical methods, and then one tries to design a numerical algorithm on the lattice to maybe search for something similar on the lattice. Now, something semi-classical is not equivalent to something quantum field theory. So again, even if we talk about magnetic scenario driven by center vortices of magnetic monopoles, it's typically in the language of semi-classical approximation, and nature must be much more complicated than that. But there is no question, I think, about that. I mean, there is, I think, no disagreement among among people who do lattice simulations, in, and particularly in search for magnetic confinement scenarios, is that there are magnetic configurations in the lattice. Now, how they exactly they work, that's unknown. Uh, uh, the is, is it a valid confinement mechanism? I think that's, that was right. the main I mean, yeah, this is, the, again, I, I wanted to illustrate yeah. the motivation for that, and whether this is, this is if this was it, we, we had the answer to the question. Are there further questions? How large is this the statistical signal of the pentaquark that you just described? The, the, um, the one of the I, can, I, I, don't, I cannot tell you from the top of my head, but it's of the order of five, I think it's above five sigma. Oh, even, even more than that, even more than that. No. This, so, when, when I was referring to the earlier experiments uh, with the pentaquark, I mean, the, those, as, as you probably all know, these were not charm pentaquarks with charm quarks, these were pentaquarks with strange quarks. And, and, and most of these experiments, I mean, there were some lower level 
problems with lower level analysis, for example, well, statistics was not good enough, for example, or, or there, was, there was some um, misidentification in track, in particle reconstruction. Now, this experiment, again, from what we can tell, seem not, I mean, seems to be, have good statistics and, and not necessarily run into these problems with sort of lower level analysis. Now, it's only one experiment at the moment, so of course it's not sufficient to, you know, already I would say uh, uh, completely claim that, uh, that this, is, this is it, but certainly the signals seem to be fairly robust. What are the alternatives? What are the alternatives? Right. So similarly to the other XYZs in the, in the meson sector, uh, the, 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 the mechanisms that, that could lead to such signals have to do with existence of, of intervening couple channels that by themselves do not produce resonances, sorry, that, that, that sort of mimic resonances in the channel that you measure. Because, because of existence of a number of, of channels, nearby channels, and in this particular case, the, the channel that sort of people have focused upon is a channel in which you're producing, instead of J psi a proton, you're producing something which is called chi C1 proton. So it's instead of J psi, which is, has sort of a quark anti quark in the ground state, chi C1 is a CC bar pair with one unit of orbit and one unit of spin. You could imagine a process in which uh, chi C1 proton and, and K is produced and then rescatters into J psi. Right. These type of interactions could mimic such signals. But, uh, so people are working hard on trying to incorporate these type of effects, of effects in the analysis. Uh, so far, uh, we don't have a, a conclusive answer whether, whether, whether it's one or the other. Are there further questions? Uh, okay, still a uh, remark. You, you mentioned the quarks as introduced by Gelman in the 60s. Yeah? So in modern terminology, this would be constituent quarks, should be distinguished, of course, from the, from the elementary Absolutely. particles. And then also, uh, so you, we have no idea why they describe the particles, the Hadron spectrum, so well. But I think in terms of representation theory, we have a clue. If we, if we divide the symmetry groups, you can, you can build as irreducible as you two blocks and uh, write the representations in this way. So mathematically, I think it's not entirely mysterious. Okay, then if you want to interpret this as you two erupts as, as par elementary particles, okay, that's a bit uh, speculative, but nevertheless, the structure, I think, mathematically, we, we have a clue in terms of representation theory, right? Yeah. Uh, yes, but mathematics is not physics. So mathematically, the standard model is described by a very simple Lagrangian, and 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 it produces a spectrum, or produces produces nature which you would never think could be described in such a simple terms. So so I think uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, there is a simple mathematics, and that's how Gelman and Zweig have come up with idea of quarks. That, that works, but dynamically, how, these, how such objects, if they are effectively generated, are generated, is a complete mystery. Okay, a last question? Well, if not, then we think again the speaker. Thank you. And uh, uh, the Institute, Institute of Sciences Nucleares, wants to give him a gift, which is one of the most important tools for a theoretical physicist, a cup of coffee.